sudden, I just started questioning everything I'd ever been told. You know, by the time, by the time I got high that very first time, when it started to hit me, and I'm like, wow. I got high. That's a chuck gonk gonk, dude. Perfect script from up north, dude. Kind of on it. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Breeder Syndicate. I'm Matt, my co host Hi. and friend, Natso. That's me. And we are here with Pipsweed from Souvenir Seeds, our very good friend. And, How's it uh, going, guys? This is an episode we've been putting together for a long, long, like four years into making something like that. We've been wanting to do something, and uh, finally we're getting to do it. It's one of our most requested shows, so I'm stoked to finally have you sitting here with us, Pip, and uh, have you interacting with me and not so and everybody can uh, hear some insight into the Ohio strains and what you're currently doing with your, your career. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Let's start talking about one of the one of the clones that held your interest the most uh, when you first started growing, what was circulating at the time? Um, I mean, when I first started growing, it was just, I, I had gotten random clones from a few different people. Uh, they weren't really anything special. It was something orange, really low yielding. Uh, that's what I ran for my first several grows and it was kind of depressing, but it was better than nothing because it had a good smell and it was, you know, decent smoke, at least for me yeah. at the time. But uh, the main ones, uh, you know, I would say probably like when the Lemon G and the Death Star came into my life was like really when I saw like the full potential of like good quality cannabis. And um, and it's, it really fascinated me. So that kind of like gave me the oomph to take it to the next level and take things seriously. And uh, and I did. And I, you know, grew those for a long time for over a decade straight and uh, made a How living long? off of them. How early into your like smoking, like from the age of where you started smoking to where you started growing, like how long did it take until you started getting like Death Star quality type weed? Okay, so when I first started smoking, I was probably around 13 and uh, I was just get I got weed from this kid at school and he stole it from his dad and sold it to me for you know $20. I paid him in rolls of quarters. I yeah. stole from my my parents closet or something yeah. like that, you know, Um and smoked it, and I, and I didn't get high. Yeah. So the first time I really ever smoked weed, I never really got a buzz. And then um, later on, you know, I would, you know, high school came around. You know, we had access to the swag, basically the seated, pressed Mexican stuff, right? Yeah. Um, There's different varying levels of that. Uh, some were actually surprisingly good. The stuff that wasn't really compressed and had the nice mature seeds in it. Uh, a lot of lime green stuff like that too. Uh, we call yeah. them the, Christ the Christmas trees, but uh, there was good stuff as well. But um, I, I don't know. I would say probably my sophomore year of high school is when I discovered what we called at the time Kind Bud, yeah. KB, um, and it was in Akron at a college party. And then one of my smoking buddies and good friends I've known for a long time came downstairs and showed me this. I was out on the porch and he showed me this bud. He's like, look at this KB, bro. And I'm like, what the hell is KB? Like, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I'm, right? I'm looking at it. I'm like, what the hell is this? He's like, it's weed. <laughs> and I, I, I looked at it and smelled it. I was like, you got to be kidding me, dude. Uh, yeah, that's confusing going from compressed to seeing like your first actual dense right? bud, like right? well-grown, manicured, fucking right. crystally bud. Yeah. Yeah. So at that point, I had already been uh, selling stuff for a while. I did through high school and stuff just to make extra money. We, you know, I didn't come from the wealthiest family in the world by yeah. any means. So uh, it was kind of in a, you know, growing up situation was kind of every kid fend for himself after a certain point. So I did what I had to do to survive and make money. So that's how, uh, that's what I did for a while. And then eventually, you know, after, I mean, senior year, I definitely, I grew some plants. I grew my first plants. Yeah. Uh, outside my parents' backyard, way in the back. And I planted them late and they weren't going to finish in time. And I knew it. So I dug them out of the ground and put them in pots and brought them inside and put them in my closet to finish out like the last, you know, three weeks or whatever they needed. Yeah. I lined the whole closet with tin foil, black light. <laughs> black lights in there like you know what i mean yeah just, yeah totally just, it was it would looking back <laughs> it's just hilarious but um 
I was worried I was going to get caught. My mom wasn't super mean, but she would, uh, she would whip my ass probably. I thought yeah. at least if she found yeah. them. And, uh, I had harvested it eventually. And then like months later, maybe a year later, she told me that, uh, while I was at school, she was watering it because it was <laughs> about to die that whole time. But she never <laughs> told me. And uh, my mom was a gardener too. I grew up growing fl- all kinds of flowers and planting gardens at our house and, and other yeah. people's houses. Uh, so that's kind of like, you know, we're, a, I got a little bit of a green thumb before the whole cannabis thing. So I understood how things work and, yeah, and you know, how to water and how to feed and, you know, what a healthy plant looks like and what a sick plant looks like and all that kinds of stuff, how to prune them. Um, and then I never heard that story about your mom. That's funny. (laughs) Bless her heart. She's a, she's a sweet lady. She's been put through hell over her lifetime, but man, I can't even picture my grandma being like, Oh, I'll just take care of the thing. Like, you know what I mean? That's pretty cool. That's pretty rad. Yeah. So, um, I would say, uh, what was it? Probably right after, right after high school is really when I started, you know, growing pretty good. And I, you know, probably three, four years after that, I, uh, I'd say 2005, six, seven ish, right around those years, I started getting a lot of really good genetics. I moved up to Akron and, uh, I met a friend of mine who is still a really good friend of mine. We know each other for a really long time. He's a good guy. His name's Jay. And he shared a lot of really nice clones with me. He shared the uh, the Bubba Kush. Uh, he shared the Lemon Chi, the Afghani Mango, the Death Star, the Sour Diesel. Uh, those were like the main ones. You know, we've had different and things over the years and stuff. This but. is very early at that time to be getting clones like that, too, for people listening yeah. that, that aren't aware. This mm-hmm. is actually pretty early to be mm-hmm. uh, having access to stuff like that in, in random circles. So My, that's Indiana, pretty cool. That's a good yeah. connect. I had the Indiana bubble gum was, was around at that time. Um, yeah. one, one of the very first ones I ever got is one that 99.9 of the you know percent of the people listening aren't going to know what it is unless you're local. But it was called um, Winaki. Some people say Hunaki. And it was pretty frequent early 2000s around this area being sold. And a lot of people around here remember it. Uh, so that's one I've had in my collection, you know, since probably 2000. What's that one like? It's a, it's kind of like Jack. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of research. It might, I, I don't know what it is. It, I feel like it could be like J1 maybe, or I don't know. I, it came from, it was a big, uh, a lot of the big Asian crews around this area uh, ran that. Mm-hmm. It was a, it was a big one uh, and it was everywhere. Uh, but this was back in the day. It was for a short period of like two or three years that I remember our group getting it consistently. Yeah, but yeah, that was one of the first ones I got. Was that a uh, tea lean queen? Yeah, it was. It was pretty. Yeah, it's like it's it's tea lean, but it's got like that funkiness, that funk yeah. foot funk kind of like thing in it. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's cool. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful plant. Uh, I I don't it's those kind of plants aren't my favorite to smoke. I don't like the terpenoline stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I've had, I keep it because I've had it for so long and I do enjoy the aromas, uh, that come from those plants. I do. I mean, I enjoy the looking at them and growing them and seeing the different colors and, you know, yeah. so I keep it around I throw it in the flower room once every couple of years and do a nice one of it and <laughs> hand it's it out to friends or something, you know, but if you're a sativa person, you know, you like that kind of stuff. That's, uh, you know, it's a good plant. It's just super nostalgic. Yeah. For if you're from around here and you were around in those times. <clears throat> so we have that. We have the when would you Winaki? <laughs> we, we called it the knock. The knock. Okay, that's the, easier. The Winaki. The 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 we we didn't want to mess around with the pronunciation, so we <laughs> just we just called it the knock. The knock. Uh, that, that wasn't like that was just our friend group. That wasn't like everybody. Yeah. You know, that was just us. We referred to it as the knock. So that's um, one of the really interesting things about weed that I like a bunch is that how like especially. It seems much more so in America than other places. Every crew is insistent on giving all these different strains. They get little nicknames. And then amongst that little crew, it becomes like just what it's known by, you know? And so these different strains at different times can take on different lives. And you only know what your friend gives it to you as. So it's like when you pass around girlfriends. You know, it can start off as that. And then it turns into the knock. And then it turns into this. And then... You know, and uh, it's it's interesting because sometimes you don't make those connections unless you know someone that knew it by both names. Right. 
Yeah. You know, it can, it can happen, you know? Um, I mean, we definitely have seen strains that like, we think it's one thing and we'll probably talk about that a little later, but we, th- we think it's one thing and then lo and behold, it turns out to be another, you know, yeah, or we think, we think it's another. And, you know, I'm, I'm originally from the Midwest too, although I've been in California a long time now. Um, and it's kind of interesting how the Midwest works in the sense that it was much less like trendy. It was basically like, as, as Pip was saying, it's like, if you got something better than Mexican, it was better than Mexican. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, there wasn't competition for it. The, the desire for something better than Mexican was huge. So any kind of kind bud you had went any kind of, right. as we called it oh, dank, yeah. you know, we used to call it nuggets. And the reason why we called it nuggets is because only nuggets were uncompressed, you know, like you had the shape of the bud, the nugget itself, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it looked like nuggets where it's like most other stuff was compressed. And even if it was lightly compressed, it still yeah. changed it. But if I can stop, yeah. So, you know, it, we had some nice stuff every once in a while, you run around nice stuff, but a lot of the homegrown stuff, back then was a little bit creamy a little bit moist still oh you know? yeah um and, and then we in my we, town anything better than mexican was kind bud right right same here like if it was same messed here. up if it wasn't yep. dried the right way or cured the right way if it was preemie mm-hmm. there wasn't competition for it there was still more people that wanted it than there was it so it just went feasters i mean feasters yeah. was kind bud I mean, this was kind, bud. Some of you guys remember that. That stuff went for the same ticket. It went for 50 and 8. You know, some people <laughs> yeah. probably charge it more. I mean, if you had a, if you knew a guy who knew a guy, you'd get the $40 deal. But, you know, straight up, it was 50 bucks an eighth when it first hit. The funny thing about, about beasters in Canada is like the really bad beasters they sent to the parts of America that they thought had no competition. And then the parts of America they thought had a little bit more competition from outdoor or indoor, they would send like a different grade. Mm -hmm. So depending on what part of the country Mm -hmm. you're in, sometimes there was some stuff that was actually pretty damn good for the time. And then there was some stuff that you were like, ooh. Now, I will say our Canadian watchers have wanted me to to say, remember, they only sent their crap down here. Right. right. Well, yeah. yeah. Press I mean, that every yeah. time we were first I mean, Canadian we, beasters, they're like, uh, just we remember, could. we had good shit. It, we just didn't share it with y'all. <laughs> we could chat about we could chat about that later too. But Pip and I have had some long combos about there's certain strains he has that he even likes them sort of fermented. Oh, and definitely. you know, and what I mean by that is that a lot of times beasters, because when you think of it, it's like it wasn't cured that great. It was still had some moisture in it. And then they'd seal it in a freezer, in a freeze, in freezer, you know, seal the meals and ship it. And it would get no air exchange for a couple of weeks until somebody cracked it. And some of that beasters would ferment. And I remember having conversations with Pip about that. And he was like, man, you know, there's a couple strains that I actually do that intentionally to because I like the fermentation process, which is almost like that African cob work. Yeah. In a way. Right. Right. Yeah. The fermentation stuff, uh, you know, it seems to me like a lot of the, the gassier stuff that I run, it does it really well. Like the Death Star, uh, you know, you cure that at a super high humidity. Uh, I have in my notes somewhere I forget. It's like I put it, keep it in like a buff, I've gallon bucket with a screw top lid for 75 percent humidity or something like that for a while. And, a, and, and not a cold area, though. You, you want that warm air to kind of like get that process going. I feel like it takes a little bit longer if you keep it in a cold area. But it does good with with a lot of the gassy stuff. The Death Star, Death Star S ones, I did it with. It was really good. Um, I think Star Dog. I think I've done it with before. Lemon G. It is. I love the Lemon G when it's done like that. When it's like slightly fermented like that. It's. Uh, I, I like it fresh too. I like it both ways. It's just you know, what's your preference? It's different. You know, just slightly different. I remember but the, you uh, sent us the uh, hash, the fermented just, hash. Oh yeah. That was just oh yeah. so people yeah. know too. Like when we talk about fermentation, if they're unfamiliar with it. A lot of times curing happens on the stem and if you trim stuff up kind of quick and it still has some moisture content going on and you start to, some people call it burping, you know, all that, that's basically like light fermentation. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you've got fully trimmed work in a bag or in a, in a, in a five gallon bucket, like he's talking about, and it's not ready to smoke yet, you're kind of fermenting it in a way. Mm Mm-hmm. In my opinion, at least. Yeah. And you definitely got to burp it, too. You can't just throw a bunch of wet weed in a bucket. and No, that's it. called molding. 
Yeah. 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 You don't want, you don't want to do that. There's a fine line. There's a fine yeah, line. It takes you a while is. to figure it out for each strain and like all that, but in the time frame and all that, but you know, I just keep it in room temp and, and it's done pretty good versus like in a colder area, stuff like that. Yeah. That's a, that's a complex process. And I'd imagine a lot of failure, uh, on the way to figuring it out. Well, honestly, it was, it was by accident, really, you know, oh, in really? my earlier years. Yeah. I just, you know, left some stuff. It just, it did the process by itself. I just, I guess I just left it in a bag or I left it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I would notice every time I did that, uh, that stuff that was a little bit more moist and sat upstairs in a bag after a couple months or whatever taste, it was like, it was a little bit darker. Like it was like, like yeah. degrading, you know, but and it wasn't as loud, but it was like with the Death Star, it was like sweet. It like mm -hmm. loses its gas a little bit and becomes like sweet. And uh, and it's just, I mean, it's super su smooth smoke. It's way smoother than like smoking a fresh bud out off of a plant or something. I remember like the smoke like was that. super, it's, it was thick smoke. Yeah, I mean. Fermented stuff, super thick, cloudy smoke. Oh, did I, one thing I, I sent you the, about it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know I got the flower. Yeah, it's uh Dude, it's it's awesome. I enjoy it. It's not something I'm going to smoke all the time, but like you know, it's, yeah. it's it's like a fine wine. It's just it's cool smoking and getting that sweet flavor and like I don't know. It's just you gotta you gotta try it to understand it. And that that's oh, also shit. something that's interesting, I think, too, about like the era we're talking about, where information didn't exchange as fast. And a lot of times, like when I learned like how I cure and stuff, it was kind of like you dry things, and sometimes it goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. And then sometimes you learn things good and bad by accident on right. how you treated it, you know, and that's kind of what it sounds like, you know, all you, you put it up there, you put it in a bag and all of a sudden it did this thing you weren't expecting. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, well, how did I do that? And you start playing with like what you did to make it do that. Right. You know, oh, does it work with this other strain? Nope. This strain doesn't like it at all. But this strain, boy, do I like what it does when it does that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of cool because, you know, a lot of times one of the cool things about growing in the Midwest is that um, because change was slower back home, people grew the same strains for longer. There mm. was there was less turnover where like all of a sudden your customers are like, oh, this is bunk. I need something new. Oh, like, yeah, that, just, that doesn't happen. They didn't know that, that. Yeah, that yeah they were just stoked to have you, time you, you get what you, what's there. That's that's what it is. And yeah. so as a result of that, sometimes Midwestern growers really got to dial in certain strains because they had a long relationship of success by being able to grow them. Right. Um, and it's also, we'll talk about that soon. Um, some of the, some of the stuff that, you know, that uh, Pip has in his collection is pretty rare nationwide because there wasn't pressure to move on to a new thing. You know, there was various clones and cuts getting passed around locally and they did well locally. So they had their own, they had a life of their own almost. Um, where in California, you know, populate, you know, popularity changes and all of a sudden everyone dumps something and just moves on to the next new thing. Right. You're I mean, exactly you right. To, you were able to, to, I mean, you were, you were telling us, you know, Death Star and Lemon G like were the better part of a seven, eight year run for you in terms of success, right? I mean, yeah, man. I mean, I, I ran them hard, hard for, you know, at least eight years, you know, and then I kind of brought new other strains in and I was still running lemon G and dust star. So, so over that, over that time, you know, you know, especially with indoor where you get to do a, a number of rips a year, you really get to learn how the plant likes to grow, how big to get it, what size pots, how to feed, all that type of stuff, you know, really like you really get to, it's like a long-term relationship. You really get to know your partner. You're, You're right. right. You're so right, man. It's, uh, you know, it took me, uh, I'd say it probably to fully master lemon G consistently, uh, especially on a bigger scale, you know, took me probably a solid four or five years, uh, you know, and that was at the beginning of when I started growing too. So nowadays it probably, it's not as difficult, but, uh, uh it, it's a finicky plant. It's not something that you can like, throw in with a bunch of other plants and expect it to, you know, do well. You got to kind of like give it its own environment, its own everything. Like lemon G doesn't like a lot of light. It doesn't like a lot of heat. Like cannabis plants in general don't, but lemon G especially. Um, I raise my lights up to do crops and it flourishes under, you know, 25 watts per square foot really really low lighting 
Um, that's half of what's suggested. I believe they suggest what 50, 60 watts per square foot for Generally flowering. Speaking, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what I've been running for most of my life. Honestly, um, it's it's I, I, I like that. I get good quality off of it, and it keeps the heat down because I don't have to have a bunch of lights packed in somewhere, you know. But that's I my also style. think it keeps the terps. Um, a lot of times, one of you know, you you do too hot of lights, and the top foot foot and a half of your plant might look gorgeous, right. but it might have some of the terps burned out by the intensity, and like actually the bottoms tend to smell and taste better so right. if you can get away with less light more of the plant brings out some of that subtlety i guess and in my area we've always i should mention we've always had low ceilings the houses uh, low basement ceilings in the houses around so uh you've actually seen before so uh i was kind of a lot of people around here use 600 waters and that's what i've used pretty much since i started i've used thousands before but 90% of what I've done has all been uh, 600 watt lights. So, yeah, well, Amsterdam had the same thing. When, when I first started going there, they were all four and 600s. They yeah. thought 1,000 watts were crazy American stuff. Yeah. So, now that we're on to Lemon G, let's talk a little bit one about the genetics of Lemon G, um, the history of Lemon G, and the terpene profile of lemon G, because that's really like, I think, I mean, what most people find really exceptional about lemon G is that flavor, smell, all that goodness. Um, <laughs> my yeah. first introduction to it was uh, on the forums. You know, there was, there was some speculation about it being skunk misty, something, you know, there's some speculation, G13 hash plant, you know, expression. Mm -hmm. What have you found out? Well, there, yeah, there's, you know, I've been told a lot of things over the years. I've been married to a lot of theories, different theories over the years, a couple at least. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of what you read is not the case. Uh, some people are close, you know, um, but I was able to get the story from a friend of mine who worked for the lady who made it. I'm not going to mention her name. Sure. Um, but she is local to, you know, the state that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and she told him that it was, uh, lemon, it was, I'm sorry, skunk misty, uh, mm -hmm. crossed with, uh, some G13. Now the, okay. G the G13, this, this lady got as seeds from, I believe from a friend. I don't think she ordered them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what they are. I have no idea. Um, could G13 skunk, G13 hash plant, G13 NL2. Sure. How many G13 crosses was there? You know, yeah, who, uh, yeah. who knows? Uh, but that's, uh, you know, and this is a, a good buddy. This is uh, my 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 really good buddy who uh, he wouldn't bull bullshit me or anything like that. Yeah. So uh, that's what she says. That's from her mouth. It's, uh, I guess, what she's always said. So just to kind of clear that up, that's where the story's at on the lemon G as far as what it is. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly what year uh, it was made. I would assume it was probably somewhere in like the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of like what I feel, but I've never really gotten an exact date on it. So. And the Turt profile, how would you best describe the flavor of G3 or lemon G? Sorry. Lemon G. Uh, lemon G. Lemon G is very, very, very lemony. Um, yeah. Not hardly, I mean, no, t no terpinoline or anything like that, really. No. Do you notice any, Matt? No. Okay, because no. I can't pick it up if there is any. Uh, I, I, lemon, I taste lemon and uh, lemon rind and lemon. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say it's a, it's, it leans lemon astringent. Yes. You know, like it doesn't have lemon. a lot of sweetness on the right. back end. It has like a very pungent well, lemon. Huh? Let me stop you. Let me stop you, sir. When you grow it like crap, it gets that very, it's that very like rindy, bitter, almost smell. But yeah. if you, if you grow that plant good, it comes out like sweet sugar candy, lemon G. Ooh. I, I'm telling you, there's, it's a finicky plant. Most people yeah, get rid yeah. of it because they can't, they can't get it to perform right. They just get that like basic version of it. Like Frank, like uh, he was just talking yeah, yeah. about. So yeah, just get that basic version. And, um, and they have a hard time with it. But like both, I said, it took me several both of years. Our faces as we both realized, oh, we only ever grew it like shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it, 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 I, I have a, t I, I have a thing with citrus where like, 
you know, there's, there's a range there from like spraying mouth, like cleaner into your mouth to yes. like a little, like I tend to like the sweet back end because it balances the astringent, you yeah. know? Um, and it's one of those things where for me, like I love citrus, but I have to have other things need other thing. I can't have citrus be my only weed. Yeah. You know, uh, when like, I describe yeah. lemon G, I always tell people it's like a lemon came into a being form, like a human form, yeah. and then pissed lemon into your mouth. That's about yeah. how I can describe lemon G. It's just so lemon. I it's it's very unique to me. Uh I've I've seen a lot of plants and I was lucky to get that plant, or I was so lucky to get that plant early yeah. on. I, I mean, that I can't believe it. <laughs> but yeah. it's so it's still to this day, it's so unique. There's nothing that I've ever seen really that smells like lemon G, like lemon G does that didn't come from lemon G. It wasn't crossed I, I would to agree. lemon G. Like I, when you pull yeah. lemon G out and you give it to somebody that's never smelled it before, I don't care who you are. Your yeah. eyes are lighting up. Like you're like, what is this? Uh, you know? Um, it just blows you away and it's a good buzz. Uh, indoor it's, it's decent outdoor. That plant is magical. I love the buzz of that stuff outside and I will only smoke lemon G if it's grown outside. Oh, wow. Um, it's just so much better in my opinion. Um, but I, I grew it indoor most of my life and it's still good. Don't get me wrong. It's still good. It's a, it's a light buzz. It's happy. Yeah. Uh, it's 100% all my female customers over the years, it's the number one requested. For some reason, the ladies absolutely love it. It keeps, it gives them energy. They clean on it, you know, and all yeah. that stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty, you know, pretty popular with the females as well. Have you, um, have you tried lemon tree or lemonade yet? Uh, I haven't. I've heard lemon tree smells a lot like lemon G, but I tend to think I, that they're related some way. Like I, I assume. To me, it's it has to be a lemon G. I assume it has to be. Yeah, in my uh, opinion. Yeah. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is my buddy mentioned that he had smoked uh, my same good buddy again. Mm -hmm. He smoked uh, uh, the G13. What was it? It was a G13 skunk uh, back in the day. And he said, that's the closest thing he's ever smelled to lemon G. It was like very spot on, but it was just kind of mild. Oh, so I thought that was a kind of interesting, you know, thing. Yeah. And then I know a lot of people are going to ask about what's the skunk misty as well. Yes. And honestly, um, I haven't, I, I, I wish I could tell you it's, Probably uh, they had a strain called Misty back in the day, didn't they? Nirvana or somebody. Yeah, Nirvana. Nirvana seeds. Not right. to be confused with – people always confuse Nirvana with Gypsy Nirvana whenever I say Nirvana. Oh, yeah. Here. So, yeah. no, Nirvana seeds had a Misty, and I can't remember – off the top of my head, I can't remember what it was. NL something. And so uh, basically everything in Amsterdam then that wasn't from Neville or a few other breeders, almost everything was was something by Skunk One. Pretty much. You know, so having something that was misty by skunk one in the nineties, that was the most common hybrid in Amsterdam was something by skunk one. Right. Because skunk one was just consistent, you know, and I actually can kind of like that, the G13 straight cut that you had Pip. Um, I can kind of see skunk and G13 in that lemon G, you right. know? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, lemon G is kind of like, it's kind of got that. I, I, this is this is like people don't take this the wrong way, but it ha kind of has that like ugliness to it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, where sure. like it there does. was an era where like we didn't have to be pretty, you know. And lemon G definitely has kind of that like G thirteen like weird bud formation, leaf formation, especially look, you know. And then you know from skunk one, some kind of citrus coming through is pretty common. So. Right. I can right. see, you know, it's it probably the skunk one probably took the G13 from being leafy in a mess and made it gave it that nice running cola that probably made it such a good cropper for you for a long time. Right. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I saw, you know, the, the lemon G for the longest time. Or let me start by saying, actually, first, uh, there's a G13 clone that's gone around this area for a long time since I was in school. Still, my parents my friend's parents grew it and my other friend's parents grew it. And, um, eventually I got it. And that thing is, I thought for sure that is what was used for lemon G because you can smell 
that in the lemon G. Like it's obvious. Yeah. You could smell that plant in the lemon G. It's like, okay, these both came from the same state. You know, they're, they smell mm-hmm. related. They're probably related. So I just always figured that's kind of what it was. But, um, and I don't know what that, it's a, with that G13 plant, I don't know if it's an airborne G13 cut from mm-hmm. the forums or whatever. I'm not sure. It's just a short little stubby Afghan. Um, uh, it, it, it's not really like, it's nothing really a lot of people would <laughs> prefer to smoke or grow these days. I feel yeah, like it's yeah. more like your head stash, unique old school Afghani type of yeah. type of stuff, but like a little soapy, a little like it's been a while since I smelled it. I lost it. You know, when I went through that whole dudding scenario, unfortunately, yeah. um, I, it's just one I've never been able to get back. I've been You've looking tried around several times, right? Like people have given you stuff back and it turned out not to be it. Uh, I mean, I think maybe once with the G, but oh, okay. you know, the G is pretty easy to spot. Like if you get a clone of that and it veges up a little, even a little bit, you know, you might even be able to tell from clone. Like it's a really unique plant. Oh, wow. Um, short squat, little Afghani, but we can talk about that in a little bit if you want. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah and I used to talk about it. And when, when we were looking, he would send me pics and we would always kind of like wonder, is it like, is it airborne? Is it Pacific? Is it something more ancient than that, that like survived in, where he's at? And I will say that like, if you look at some of the Neville's few picks that he put up of the classic G- G13 clone, it kind of had that like gnarly, ancient, Afghani, ugly look to it. I thought it for looked la- very similar. Like for, lack, for lack of a better term, that's not dissing. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of weed that I think is kind of ugly that I actually love to smoke. Chem not 91, all- the ugliest plant ever. It's not the ugliest plant ever, but there's on a, earth. No, there is definitely some haze that I find that I find attractive that is way more hideous. Nah, you know? it's Kim 91. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, this thing doesn't have any crystal, doesn't have any sugar leaf. It's loose. It's calyxes. It's bullshit, you know, and then, uh, yeah, I curse, but we're in the middle of it. So <laughs> <it's probably fine. laughs> you're all right. You're good. We're, we're after a minute in. <laughs> But maybe so that we we chatted about the lemon G for a second. Why don't we chat oh, about yeah. the other thing that you got early that you really love, which is the Death Star. Oh yeah, which is a classic. It has a great name, and it's been consistently one of your favorites, basically from now to then. It really hasn't shifted. Yep. Yeah, the Death Star is my all star. I've loved that plant since the day I got it. The day I smoked it, I was so happy. The day I got it. Um, you know, I only had probably at that point like 10 or 12 plants in my collection and it just completely kicked them all out of the water. You know, I, I like oh, that, yeah. that hardcore, like potency, like knock you down, put you into the couch type of stuff. And, uh, and that's the effect you get off the Death Star. But, you know, you also get the super crazy, like oniony tennis ball, like yeah. rubber gas, like skunk like nastiness acre. everything's there you, you know, uh, and you grow a killer people don't understand like <laughs> i've had shitty death star like where it's grown to where where there's not very much burnt rubber at all where it's more of that oniony spicy back end and it's just right. not very good but then i've had your death star where it just kicks its ass so when he's <laughs> describing this if 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 it smells different than the way he's describing it, it's because he's grown it very, very, very well for a very long time. So go ahead, continue, please, on the All history right. of Death Star. Okay. Um, I, I guess where do I start? I guess I'll start at uh, Team Death Star, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, they're from Ohio, Columbus area. And they are the people that created the Death Star. The Death Star is a cross of uh, Sensi Star and um, Sour Diesel. And they, it was an accidental pollination, I guess. Um, and they had a couple seeds and they sprouted them and they picked the Death Star. And one of those few seeds that they sprouted was this amazing plant. Um, yeah. And I was so lucky, I was so lucky to get it in the mid 2000s at the time when I had, you know, only been growing for four, five years or something like that. And I was just so intrigued by this plant and how potent it was and how much yield it put out. So I just started putting it in all my rooms basically that I had, that I had flowering and I just started growing it and growing it and growing it. And it, I mean, there's people at my door with pitchforks, you know, three weeks before harvest, like, where's (laughs) it? We need it. We need it. Like it was, it was scary. It's just, it's just, it, it flew off the shelves. Yeah. Um, 
and I enjoyed, I was smoking it all the time. <laughs> I bet. Uh, but yeah, so that it came from, uh, from them. They got, uh, uh, the, uh, the sour diesel cut they got, I think came from uh, fish show in Vermont. Back in like, uh, I forget the date. It was like 2004, I think. Fish did okay. like a farewell show at an airport in Vermont. And um, and they picked up, I don't know if they picked it up in Vermont or if they picked it up back along the way from Vermont to Ohio. Mm-hmm. But along that trip is when they acquired that. And then um, from what I've heard, a, a, another friend of theirs uh, went to Amsterdam and got seeds and came back. And um, I guess they were grown and a selection was made and that was given to team death star by a friend of theirs. And then that's how the cross got the death star got made. Um, okay. One of the yep. things maybe I should mention, cause it's like a long-term running joke, but it ties into what Matt and Pip were just discussing is that, um, you know, it, it takes probably a good 84 days. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's about, that's, that's what I push it to. Like you can pull it at 77 days. I mean, a lot of people would pull it at 70 days. That's where a lot lot of people make. That's the point I'm going to make is that one of the differences and one of the reasons why it might be so good from Pip versus other people is that, you know, he was willing to actually see like, how long does this thing need to go before it hits perfection? And what happens like, and this used to happen with sour diesel a lot in California, is that there's people that would grow it until it hit the sweet spot. And there's people that would grow it until it hit good enough for market. And there's a vast difference that like, say you might be able to cut off. Like he was just saying, if you cut Death Star at 70, it might fly out the door, but not be as nice. And Pip would take it an extra two weeks and it would reach this extra level. And I think the same thing would happen with sour out West. It would happen with some other cuts where it was like, there was croppers where like, as soon as it had the nose and was good enough to go, it's time to cut it. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that don't like taking anything over nine or 10 weeks, you know? And sometimes not with everything, sometimes you go downhill, but with some things, if you give it that extra week or two, um, it makes a huge difference. Uh, It really really does. You know, it, it lets the potency and the flavor and some of the depth come out. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think when Matt was talking about all oh, this Death Star sucks, there was probably a lot of Death Star that was cut at 10 that needed to go 12. I'm sure there was a lot cut at 7 that, <laughs> that needed yeah, to go know, 12, the, too. The earlier you cut it, you know, yeah. the, the less nuance and depth it'll yeah. have. So, yeah. Uh, one thing else I wanted to add too is when this accidental cross happened, I believe it actually pollinated some other plants as well. They had uh, the Indiana bubble gum, which was a clone I had at this time as well. It yeah. was pop- popular around here. Uh, and they had the dumpster, which is a popular one from, you know, back in the day around here. And I think those were both pollinated uh, because when I was at, you know, the festival Nelson Ledges in, you know, the mid 2000s, I was seeing these strains called bubble star and dump star. Yeah. I think there was maybe one or two more that I can't recall right now, but I definitely remember seeing a lot of the bubble star. Um, I remember the death star was a little bit difficult to get. And I think the sensi star was a little bit difficult to get as well. I don't think it was just like lots of it, you know? Yeah. Kind of like um, the, you mentioned dumpster. Yeah. You mentioned dumpster. Ohioans are going to want to hear about dumpster. Can you rep <laughs> Ohio's dumpster for us? What what the hell is dumpster? Does it smell like a dumpster? Was it really found in a dumpster? <laughs> What's the story, bro? <laughs> oh, that's I haven't heard it from the horse's mouth. I've heard a lot of things over the year, and it's it's all generally lines up. You know, things yeah. get left out over the years. Things get added, I guess. So take it whatever I say as is, but. So supposedly it was uh there was a couple of guys growing together uh one of them is known as the professor okay and i was told that they basically had a falling out and they were they were growing this plant and then they had a falling out and they threw this whole room away into a trash. the one guy threw the whole room away into a trash can or something and then the other okay. guy went back and got the cut that they were growing out of the dumpster and called it dumpster that's so stupid. Uh, All right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I mean, that's that's just what I've heard. I'm not 100 yeah, yeah. percent sure. I know there's more details. Um, I do have some connections. I can get more details on that from. But uh, you know, I think uh, what did I what did I say? It, it kind of it kind of reminds me of like the there's a garlic bud pick 
And mm-hmm. have you ever seen that? The, what is it? 1989. Yep. Yeah. It's the seed bank, right? It kind of reminds me a lot of Dumpster. It's really, it's, it's almost dead on that leaf and everything. It just looks, you know, just like it. Yeah. Uh, so I've heard people say it's, you know, Shiva skunk, you know, NL5 skunk one. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there was a lot of that sold. So yeah, I mean, definitely possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, there the other was. interesting part, just real quick before we get yeah. off on that tangent, is that at the seed bank, Neville called this line garlic bud. And then when it and then when Sensi Seeds sold the same line when they bought his company, they called it Shiva Shanti. Right. You know, um, and so there could be some truth to both. Um, yeah. It could, it be, you know, Pip and I have chatted about it does very much look like sort of an old NL skunk type hybrid of some kind. You know, what does it, it does. smell like? What's the turf profile? Uh, I classify it as like it's like a, a sweet pineapple with like that toe jam funk. There's like a funk in it, too. You know, uh, that's kind of that's kind of like where I lie with it. It's it's uh, it's good smoke. It's decent. It's it's I mean, to be honest, it's just average smoke. It's a commercial, just typical, like a commercial type variety. Yeah. A lot of people did a lot of grows of dumpster in Ohio over the years. And oh, it's yeah. because it yields like crazy. But um, it does get big buds. It's a little bit prone to mold. you got to watch out. Um, but overall, it's I mean, it's a staple in Ohio. It's been around for 20 years or whatever now. So... Let's it's a, it's a good one. There was a there was a fake one that went around Ohio. I think oh, really? Jason mentioned it in his books. It was called Chumpster <laughs> <laughs> with a C A with a C H Chumpster. Yeah. Uh, I personally never saw that one, but mm-hmm. I just figured I would mention it. Uh, and it was uh, mostly run in Toledo back in the day, I believe, at first, and that's like where like the professor and all that stuff was. But I've also okay. heard people say that there was a guy in Columbus. Uh, and that's where this whole situation happened as well. So I'm just not a hundred percent sure, but that's kind of where I'm at uh, with the dumpster. Cool. Yep. How about the, um, Afghani mango? I know that's another older classic. Oh man. The Afghani mango. Afghani yeah. mango. Yep. I got that. Uh, I got that around again, around mid two thousands, uh, from my okay. buddy. Uh, it was one of his favorite ones. And I remember going over to his house one day, he was living up in Akron and I walk in and I smell this smell. I'm like, man, that smells, I mean, that is really unique. What, what are you smoking? He's like, I'm smoking Afghan mango. And he was smoking it out of his volcano vaporizer. Oh, nice. So he gave me some puffs and uh, I smoked it. And the flavor was unbelievable. It was just like this like soft mango, a little bit of uh, uh, sweet for sure. A little bit of like metallic smell in there as well, I feel like. Yeah. It was just super interesting, and then he, you know, brought me upstairs and showed me like two or three lights in an upstairs bedroom, a little window AC or something, and a fan. And he had uh, he had it growing up there, and it was just such a unique looking plant. I, uh, I mean, I'd really never seen anything like it up until this point. I was growing a lot of like kind of more like indica dominant stuff, whereas yeah. the Afghani mango is definitely a little bit more sativa. It makes these long spears that kind of like aren't thick, but they fill in. They're just like long spears. And uh, and I ran it for ran it for quite a while, but it could be finicky. Uh, it does this weird thing; it'll stunt out sometimes, uh, like kind of like fail to start. Um, yeah. And then it also, if if the conditions aren't perfect, it can tend to like herm a lot, or like if one plant in the room is like by the fan, constantly getting beat up the whole time, like it yeah. can herm. So I never really did large runs of it. It's been a commercial Ohio strain for a long time. Lots of people have done big big runs of uh afghan mango and pass it around the state over the years and stuff but it's just a it's a super unique one um i don't know exactly what it is i've i've you know i've i've seen um angel's breath and i like i've told you before matt by mr yeah. nice and angel heart and that and it kind of looks very similar to that but um i know you've mentioned to me that those are relatively recent releases within the past 10 11 years yeah and um i've had the afghan mango for you know for longer than that obviously so yeah yeah i guess that would you know that would kind of nullify it but i don't know 100 percent. super unique plant it's been around ohio for a long time kc33 maybe always an option um kc mango i'm not sure oh yeah the the kc brain stuff yeah you know that's older and, and 
I mean, it was it was grown a lot because it was one of the more affordable lines, but there was great, yeah. great stuff in it, like amazing stuff in it. A lot of breeders ended up knocking it off later on too. Uh, BC's BC mango is based on that one. I'll have to take a look into that. Yeah, yeah, it might be another direction. Yeah, I've uh, I've talked to a lot of people, you know, a lot of local people, people in the weed game over the years, and I always ask about Afghan mango because it's one of the ones that I have the least information about. Yeah, I don't know who made it. I don't know if they made it, if they bought seeds of it from a company, when it came around. Um, it's definitely, you know, early to mid two thousands areas where I would put it, put that one. We gotta ask Konza where he sourced his seeds. See if he has any kind of anything on it. Have you ever talked to him about it? No. Uh -uh. Yeah, I haven't either. Have to ask him. No. Okay, so we go from the, 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 we haven't done four way, have we? Um, I don't believe we have. Let's hit four way. <laughs> All right. The uh, the four way. I had um, I had originally gotten a plant back in I don't know the exact date 2014 15 16 somewhere around there probably mm -hmm. uh, I had gotten a plant from a friend of a friend and it was called uh, Sensi Star and I grew it and I realized I had smoked this before you know but I couldn't it's been so long I couldn't tell you know like is this yeah. the Sensi Star I smoked or you know so. So I had grown it for years and I had liked it. And I, after growing it a couple of times, I really noticed a lot of similarities to the Death Star because I've been growing Death Star forever. Yeah. Uh, it kind of has that like little zigzag uh, structure it does. And some of the aromas in it as well kind of, uh, kind of are very similar. So, you know, I actually thought for a long time that it actually was the, the plant that was used uh, to make Death Star pot. Sure. Basically. But uh, recently I found, you know, I was wrong. Uh, Death Star. I've grown Death Star S1s. I've definitely seen the S1 progeny, and it's mm -hmm. pretty pretty clear now that they are, uh, you know, Sensi Star dominant. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, I, I feel like it's related. The the four way my cut, what you know, is related somehow. Whether it's part of Sensi Star or a, a component of it was used to make Sensi Star or something like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of like that's kind of where I where I'm at now with, with that. I, I grew that Sensi Star for years. And then eventually uh, along the way, I had gotten plants under different names, um, such as it's, it's they were the same plant as my Sensi Star. I got it under the name of Death Star from some people. I got it under the name of Four Way from a guy. I got it under the name of, you know, all this different yeah. stuff. And every time over the years I grow it out, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's the same plant again. Like, why and is this it? is the one that you kept getting back as different plants? Oh That's my it. gosh. Yeah. It, it, was, yeah. it was crazy. So, you know, fast forward several years after that. Uh, a couple years ago, I uh, I was looking. I reached out to a friend of her, of a friend who had a friend, um, mm -hmm. who said that they had the Ohio Four Way clone that used to go around. Mm -hmm. So I I uh, I get in contact with him. I go over to his house, and he's a super cool guy, a little bit older. Mm -hmm. And he shows me a jar of the flower, and and I kind of like you know saw the resemblance. I was like almost like this is that same plan again, but I wasn't <laughs> sure. And then he took me downstairs into his little hut and he had like a light with like, you know, three or four plants and yeah, they weren't yeah. in the best shape. They had some thrips on them and stuff, uh, but it just wasn't the best representation. So I wasn't a hundred percent sure yet. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, he, you know, he gave me the cut and I brought him some stuff too, because he's from a small circle. He doesn't have access to a bunch of stuff. So sure. I gave him some cool stuff to grow and I went and, you know, grew this thing out. And uh, when we were talking and smoking his flower, when I met up with him, he told me that he's had it for 20 years and that one of his buddies was the guy that bought the seeds and made the selection back in the day. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he originally said, uh, you know, the guy that I met, uh, that I got the cut from, said that it was from Sensi Seeds, but I had him actually contact his buddy, the guy who mm -hmm. you know, got him, and he confirmed that he said he got him from Nirvana. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, you know... Nirvana's description is slightly different from Sensi Seeds, but, you mm -hmm. know, they did a lot of work with other people's lines yes. back in the day. So it wouldn't be surprising to me if it was more than likely just Sensi's work that they were using. Yeah. That's probably the most, you know, 
you know, and Nirvana That's was probably, fun. I probably would have bought Nirvana's over Sensi's during, you know, during those early era, that early era, because Nirvana's was always like $90, whereas Sensi's was like 240 you know? It was a right. big difference. Yeah. And, oh, Nirvana, right. oh. <laughs> Nirvana verifiably took various lines from Sensi um, and reproed them and made, and gave them their own names. I mean, they famously took Neville's NL2 and called it Oasis. That's Dutch um, Passion. Oh, that's Dutch Passion. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was yeah. it was very common. Yeah. Um, and all that. And then one thing we probably should mention about the about the Sensi Star itself is that even though it came out in 1995, uh, we still don't know what the heck it is. Right. You know, and you, I mean. He's he's been extremely uh, reluctant to mention any parentage uh, as far as uh, the guy who owns Paradise. You and you know what else I found interesting was in 95, Sensi Seeds um, re-released the four-away. Uh, I don't know what they mean by that. Uh, but in 1995, they did. And then a year after, in 96, I believe, was when Paradise started and released the yeah. Sensi Star, right? Yeah, I believe so. That's what was actually released. Pretty pretty close together. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, can't prove anything. But, you know, it's just, uh, like I said, it's possible that uh, that four-way was used or that one of the components that make up four-way was possibly used, you know? And, and that's coming through expressing. So, yeah. Was was Afghan tea in four-way? It took a long time for us to figure out. And then it was one of those things that was hiding in plain sight where uh, Neville wrote in his 87 update to his catalog that he was about to release this strain called Four Way, and it was Big Bud NL1 by Early Pearl Skunk One. That's right, it was Early yes. Pearl on it, yeah. And, um, and so it was, it was another one of those things that like Pip and I and others, we hunted and hunted and hunted forever, looking for any information on what, what actually the makeup was. Um, and then it was one of those things that was just like hiding in plain sight if you knew where to look. Yeah. Um, and so it was honestly one of those, like the nineties was a lot of F ones, but that was an early poly hybrid. Um, you know, because I believe, uh, I believe Neville released both of those plants that made up four way as separate strains. Big bud NL one just became the big bud line. Mm-hmm. And early Pearl Skunk One, I believe, got released as early Skunk. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was already lines he was playing with separately to begin with, and then he took Just two of them and combined them together. Yeah, and there you go. And so, obviously, as a four-way hybrid, um, it could lean in different directions, um, and especially amongst the progeny and stuff like that. But um, yeah. So uh, I wanted to clarify, uh, today, if you go on their website, Sensi Seeds labels it as Indian by Afghanistan, by Pakistan, by Skunk One. Oh. I don't know I don't, I don't know when this was released. It's not in any of their 90s catalogs. Um, but they did use, in 1987, Neville did the up, send an update for his 87 catalog, right? And he said yeah. he was going to you know, have a four-way yeah. hybrid. The next year, he comes out with four and more. And that's the only year it comes out. And then two years go by, 89 and 90, and it's not in the catalog. And then in 91, Sensi Seeds comes along and releases Four Way. And they use the same exact description that Neville used for his Four and More. Yeah. For yeah. Their four same, way. same finish time, same verbiage in the description. Same to a all, that type, all that type of stuff. So yeah. clues like that, you know. Um, and, you know, I mean, we don't know, like, you know, there's all, there's some other famous cuts out there. There's the Fairfax four-way that supposedly was from the same line. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously, like, if you get a four-way hybrid, um, it could lean in a number of different directions, you know. Right. One thing I wanted to pull on real quick because I wasn't clear on it. When you were talking about the, 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 the bubble star and some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, was that made with Death Star pollen or was that made with pollen from maybe like the East Coast Sour Diesel that threw on some of those other plants? It, it was, probably wouldn't it, be called it was, Star. It, it was the Sensi Star that threw. It was the Sensi. So the Sensi Star was the was the the dad, if you will. Yes. That the Sensi sense. the Sensi Star threw. The Sensi Star threw. Okay. So yeah. that's where that's where Bubble Star and some of those other hybrids you were talking about that you would see floating around came from. Uh, yeah, it definitely came. I feel like it definitely came from that same accidental pollination or it, I don't say accidental. I've heard that they saw that the Sensi star was kind of making pollen and they kind of used it and sprinkled it is what I've heard as well. Who knows what happened? But um, but yeah, I, I mean, believe early, it was made. 
early feminine seed used to be like, you know, uh, you know, str- you know, plant gets stressed, accidental pollen flies, and then all of a sudden you have some feminized bag seed. Right. Long before we figured out STS or any of these other methods that modern we're, we're using in modern times. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know, Matt's smiling over there or whatever, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and, you know, for old people like me, we used to think that that accidental pollination, like if you use that, you were cheating and it would probably ruin the line because it was made not the natural way. That was a big belief back in the day. It was a big belief. You're like, oh, you're going to use some Herm accident stuff. You're going to yep. probably like imprint that into your seed line and you'll never get it out and it'll be worse. Um, so that just goes to show how ignorant we were at the time. We were convinced that, you know, uh, that huh. the other day Caleb made a post and I, it drives me nuts. Absolutely nuts when I see this, but it's the typical, what I call the typical hippie response to like a feminized seed post is like, ha, huh, see, like it was, it was CSI posting about a, a, a reversal failure. Right. And they're like, ha, huh, it's cause, cause you were, you were messing with nature is what, what happened there. And then I had to point out, you know, they, nature, once these plants intersex, it's, it's because man's intervened that they're regular seeds. So actually, actually, if you really want to get technical, they're taking it back. And it's just yeah. like this really bad logical argument that they seem to have in their heads that herming is us being bad with plants. Weed used to be very bro science. Yeah, there used to still be is. there used there there used to be a lot of bro science, and what I mean by that is just stuff that gets passed around in smoking circles and stuff like that. And I mean, I've talked about it on previous shows where we used to put our best Mexican bud in the resin chamber, so it would gain <laughs> quality. The resin chamber, <laughs> you know, you put that nice chamber. Mexican bud in your resin chamber, and you don't smoke <laughs> that until the end, and then you pull that <laughs> resinous bud out, and you thought that was an improvement, so. There was a lot of, of misinformation in the 90s and early 2000s when the internet and and sort of like, you know, facts. It was basically just a bunch of kids spreading what they heard from older people, maybe, or yeah. reading in high times. You know, we used to think high times was sort of the Bible. They are. You know? <laughs> and uh, then you get older and you're like, oh, man, who takes that advice? But it was a real era in that regard. So, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, four way, uh, you know, it, it ended up being one of your favorite plants. It did, man. It's, uh, it's, it's just, you know, super unique, super old school. You can tell if you've been growing, growing a lot of plants, you can grow it and look at it and be like, yeah, that's definitely not from around this time period, you know, um, definitely some like nineties weed, something like that. I wasn't really growing or smoking in the eighties, so I didn't see a lot of that stuff. But I've seen enough stuff from, you know, back in the day to know when something's a little bit older and, you know, different than would cookies. You say, would you say that the, the four-way, the Ohio four-way is skunky at all? Yes. That's interesting. Because that, that yeah. the Fairfax four-way, like the one time when I got to, because it was super dudded when I got it. But um, okay. it, the one time I got to, like, get any hint of smell out of it, you could smell, like, what direction it was going. It was like, oh, wow, this does have potential to be as skunky as they've talked about. It really does. So I was wondering yeah. if the other it's cut does. It's the I don't know the the four way that I have is it's not as skunky as like the Death Star. You know, sure, it doesn't. Sure. It's not like that. Uh, it's it's milder than the Death Star. Yeah, but it's got more like other stuff in it. You know, it's like yeah. that. Like I don't know how to that old world like those old world smells. You know, yeah. like mm-hmm. kind of stuff like that hashy, spicy. Uh, you know, skunky stuff going on in there yeah definitely the one the other one was like um had oniony in it too that was the yep. other smell i could really smell yeah definitely but there's some stuff about that four-way certain things about it that remind me of stuff you'd see from afghan tea stuff so i always found that right. interesting based okay. on what's in it i don't really see afghan tea in it unless afghan tea's in skunk one or something like that which is something that i'd always like to dig further into yeah, I mean it. It uh, it was it was one of those confusing things for a really long time because Neville was one of the only guys that just sort of laid out what was in his stuff. All that second wave of breeders pretty much intentionally obscured uh, genetics. 
which yeah. for like his people like us who are a little younger, younger than that, and historians trying to figure out what they used. Um, even 25, 30 years later, some of those people don't want to just come off it. Like, what would it what would it matter if Luke came out and, you know, and said, this is what I used to make Sensi Star in 1995? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Oh you know, like big secret. Oh, can't let that out. You know, like and but to this yeah. day, it's still kind of like, eh, what's it? What is it? You know, as of this year, as recent as this year, he will not say, unfortunately. Yeah. I, I'd love to have him on to to talk about it, but yeah, we've been getting declined. That's that's, that's been okay. around Robin, and you know, it's yeah. one of those things where for a lot of people, it's like if it doesn't benefit me, why would I say it? And it's like, do I want to say that I like ripped it off from Neville, or I got it from this other person that I never gave credit to, or whatever the story may or may not be? They'd prefer yeah. it to remain a mystery because it's okay. not like anyone's going to go and like find the parents twenty five years later, thirty years later, and like recreate it. I mean, that ship has sailed. While we're in this territory, let's hit my personal favorite. <laughs> the one, like, the 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 bud <clears throat> that made me fall in love with Pips grows, the Silver Pearl. Let's talk about that girl. Where did she come from? Mm. Uh, the Silver Pearl uh, came from uh, a local guy that actually got a hold of me on IG. I think I met him. I think we have a mutual friend as well. Um, at the time. And, uh, I'm not going to say either of their names, but sure. yeah, that's, that's who I received it from. Uh, uh, preface this saying like our group has had this clone for a long time back in the day. And I never grew it because I was so busy tied up with lemon G and death star. Like that was my, yeah. my show. That was my MO. So like I didn't have time for anything else. I already had 10 or 12 plants. That was more than enough for me being a cropper. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of always passed on it. I would smoke it. You know, my friends would have it. They'd bring it over and they'd bring it to our little, you know, cannabis cups that we had and stuff back in the day yeah. up here in Akron. Um, but I never really grew it. And then as we got older, you know how things go, stuff gets lost. It's not in the circle anymore. And, yeah. uh, and I wanted to give it a riff. So, you know, I was able to get in touch with this guy and he, uh, he had gotten it from an older gentleman who lived down Southern Ohio, I believe. And had it for quite a while. And then, uh, you know, I eventually acquired it from him, you know, gave him some stuff, some seeds, and I forget what else, but uh, it was it. And a funny story is like a week later, I got another plant uh, that I was looking for. I was looking for that G13 we were talking about earlier. And uh, someone gave it to me and I grew it up and I knew before I even flowered it, it was Silver Pearl. So I got Silver Pearl twice in the same week from, or basically the same people. From different people. Yeah. Uh, One thing I'll say that's interesting about that cut is that, and not everything does this, but that cut grown out looks amazingly like some of the oldest pictures oh, yeah. of silver pearl that you can find. I mean, you know, you don't want to use the word dead ringer too much or anything like that, but boy, uh, visually, does it look like it's, it's just you know, just walked out of the catalog and into your collection. <laughs> it really yeah. does. It looks like if you were to look at, at hips, silver pearl cut, and you were to look at some of those old pictures of silver pearl and you didn't know which was which you'd have a hard time telling the difference in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, it really looks, it really, it really does resemble. So that's not proof or anything like that, but it certainly helps. Right. Right. Uh, you know, silver pearl is just such a special plant. Uh, mm. It's not like a narcotic hitter like I, I prefer. Uh, I respect all cannabis regardless of whether I enjoy it or not. You know, I yeah. give it all a chance. I enjoy all the different aspects of it, even if I'm not smoking it, you know. Yeah. But uh, but the silver pearl really grew on me. Uh, when I first smoked it, I was kind of, I don't know, off put by it because I wanted something, you know, hard hitting. Yeah. But after after smoking it for a while and giving it a chance and seeing what it's really about, uh, you know, smoking it fresh when you wake up in the morning, uh, you know, nothing yeah. in your system, you're fresh. Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it's amazing. It's really just yeah. really uplifting, motivating, happy, you know, bright buzz. Uh, yeah. on a, you know, it's, it's very more of like a sativa, it's almost like what you'd think of like a sativa, right. But sure. on a plant with that's short and squat and finishes in, you know, 50 days. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's I, I call the high electric, maybe not, yeah. not in the sense that it's, um, like giving you a rush, but it's bright and happy to me. Very bright and happy is the best way I could describe it. And the, and the, 
the scent profile, like me and Natsu describe it completely opposite. And, and it, it's really just two different takes on it, but it's because of how complex it is. How would you describe it? Oh, uh, I have a description I wrote of it somewhere. I'll try to remember some, but it's, it, the basic smells are, it's, it's like a, uh, it's kind of like a sweet melon. It's got a little bit of baby poo in there, like that funk. It's got mm -hmm. the, like the funky funk foot funk i guess a little bit type thing it's got uh some like anise like almost like a black licorice type anise. of you know thing so um so those not are so, kind of not so loves the anise <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no like yeah i see for me when i smell it i smell like pink bubble gum is the first smell i smell and oh yeah you, you, d just grew it outdoor and i smelled it and i smelled it again and the first smell i smell is pink bubble gum but then there's like funky skunk background but not yeah. quite it's just yeah it's got so much going on matt that confuses a lot of people a lot of people have yeah. a hard time really like nailing it uh because there's just so much there's, there's so much to there. it it's, yeah. it's not like some of these it, there's just so many different i mean you can sit there and smell it for 10 minutes straight and and pick yeah. out all the different it's uh it's just really really unique really awesome you know short flowering indica like i said 50 days not the biggest yielder in the world uh you got to defoliate it it's a little bit you know like yeah. leafy throws fan leaves everywhere big fat indica and but yeah, it's got it's a leafy. great yeah got a great structure and you don't even have to i don't think i've ever netted or staked a silver pearl plant in yeah. my life regardless of how big it's been i mean i grow up into like five gallons i don't go bigger than that but you know they it just so they support themselves like you don't even have to mess with them at all so good outdoor and stuff uh one of the you, things that's interesting about it is that because pip mentioned it is that when he says baby poo i also get a strong baby poo smell off it but just to clarify like it smells to me like infant baby poo like oh. when all they're all they're on is mother's milk Ooh. Like they haven't gotten any kind of real food. Like, cause, because I, I have a number of kids or whatever. So like, you know, I'm familiar with uh, that He's era, a but, but there's a very different smell to baby poo when they're one, two, three, four months old, whatever. And all they're eating is mommy's milk. Right. Then when they get actual real food. So it doesn't smell like some kind of like gnarly kid poop. It smells like this weird, it's almost like one of those things to me where like if it wasn't in cannabis, you would guarantee say it doesn't smell good, but there's like smells in cannabis that smell weird, but you like them, but they're in weed and it's kind of caught that skunky, sweet, sickly baby poo and it doesn't sound, maybe that doesn't sound too appetizing, but it really is. No, oh, I think it's a beautiful there, smell. There is in the progeny, um, there is a little bit of mint and I can smell a slight hint of it in the mom, but I, I got some nice, uh, nice selections I made that are like extremely, like super minty. You know, wow. it was, uh, it really, you know, threw me off guard, surprised me. I also think it smells like a little bit, some of them like a, like a melony, a melon mm -hmm. kind of, you know, uh, it's just, I mean, it's got a lot going on, man. Um, so what silver pro is supposed to be according to Neville is NL five, uh, female, the famous clone crossed with, a early pearl skunk one male right and that makes uh, silver pearl i mean and, i go ahead uh, go ahead and one of the things since we, were, since we were just talking about four-way i don't have any proof um i don't know how many different males neville decided to use of early pearl skunk one but it's somewhat possible that it could have the same dad as four-way it, I mean, anything's possible, man. You know, because it's like it, it, it's the same mix from the same guy. Yeah. It's, you know, the dad is early Pearl Skunk one in both the hybrids. Is it a different male? But it's definitely the same line, mm -hmm. you know. And so. that, that early Pearl is a uh, early girl crossed with Pollyanna. Yeah. Um, and that that's, you know, that's what, you know, they used to cross. I thought it was the NL5, I had an NL5 skunk one male. I had it written down like that because I wasn't able to find exactly what know. it is. Yeah, but it's good the same. We have, good the thing same we have genetics. our strain base coming out. So oh, you thank can go God. Look it up no, yeah, it's specifically. It's, it's, the, it's the NL5 by, by early pearl skunk one, you know, so it's a three-way hybrid. Mm -hmm. uh silver pearl and what's interesting is since matt and i have been kind of doing a deep dive on some of the early girl early pearl stuff is you don't really realize it but secretly 
it was one of the most common things Neville used throughout his lines. He loved it. He loved okay. that early pearl. Um, he loved he loved mixing it into different stuff. And so it's it doesn't really get talked about that much, but it was one of his favorites. And where did the early girl come from? Northern California. Northern California. <laughs> early girl. Yeah. And Pollyanna and just, was, huh? We just recently found out um, that one of them, one of them, I can't remember if it's early girl or Pollyanna. I think it was Pollyanna. I mean, it was early girl. One of them is not from Rob or Sam. And I always thought both were from Rob. Rob. Yeah. No, Wait, that's really? the, there's a lot of assumptions. So early girl, <laughs> I believe is a, is an Afghan Mexican. And then they took that and they crossed that to Pollyanna, which is an early Colombian by Mexican. And that's early Pearl. Um, and we also learned that that sweetness uh, is very, was very prevalent in the early Pearl. And it was one of Neville's favorite things. And he wanted to recreate it really badly later in his life because he enjoyed From the Oaxacan. The, he really enjoyed sort of that double Mexican Afghan blend that was early pearl and that's why it showed up in so many different hybrids he had and so later in life trip. later in life he was working a specific oaxacan line i don't remember where he sourced it from specifically it was later but um he felt that that was very similar to what he saw in the early pearl if i remember correctly okay. and this is there's a there's a gentleman that that matt and i chat with on ig um, and he, his family used to grow early pearl in the nineties for about five years, uh, up in my neck of the woods. And he's been kind of on the hunt to find, he they got lost in a bus sadly, but he oh, did man. say, Pip, he, he sent me not knowing that we're buddies. He sent me this pic you had posted a number of years ago of an early, of a silver pearl S one. And he goes, man, does this look like my parents plant? Oh boy, <laughs> he did. He did. You know, so uh, well, take that for what it's worth. But he go. But there was a. There, yeah, he showed me this picture, and it's from you. You know, and he's like, this one really looks like my parents' old cut mm -hmm. of early pearl. So wow. who knows? You know. Yeah, you never know. It's I mean, there. it's 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 pretty unique plant. Once you've been around it and you've seen some progeny, you could kind of tell. Um, you know what's related if it's related or not so i have no doubt that you know that's what he had and he thought that mine looked like his and it's also one of the rare things that pip doesn't take 84 days <laughs> it doesn't take 84 days it's done before most of my plants are even halfway done flowering <laughs> yeah it's, it, like, it's so 50, fast 55 or something like that it's like most. i mean you could pull it before 50 if you wanted to it's just uh it's it's so quick i feel like i throw it in the flower room and feed it for two weeks and then you know, so it's like it's basically like a true seven weeker. Yeah. Oh man, it's super quick. Yeah, super quick. I mean, some of them go into the fifties, you know, fifty-five days or whatever. But some of the progeny was done in forty-six, forty-seven days. You could probably pull it forty-five if you lived in nineteen ninety. Like they always like, yeah, yeah. You know, you see these seed descriptions and flowering times, and you're like, oh, it's done in you know sixty days. And really, freedom thirty-five, oh, bro. I mean, I being, <laughs> what I was the flowering a, time on Super Skunk? <laughs> I remember yeah, being I, a kid, I 49, 49, You know, <laughs> just getting started on indoor and seeing those fifty-day strains and being like, I could get eight crops a year. You know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's so trade-offs trade to everything. It was super yeah. enticing. You know, you're just thinking, oh my gosh. Uh, I didn't realize that it was a bit, it was a bit of marketing back then claiming everything took six or seven weeks, but, um, you know, it was, and then I realized how rare it was to find something that developed that quickly that I actually liked. Right. So, um, so we got through, uh, the Ode to Neville. Let's get to Q, Q36. Oh boy. Q36. Q36. Alludium. Q36 is a wild one. Um, again, I don't have an exact date, but it's somewhere like 2010, 11-ish, 2009 yeah. to 2011. Somewhere in there, I would probably put it. Uh, so it's relatively kind of like new kid on the block out here uh, for yeah. Ohio. And it's uh, when I first got it, it was in like 20, 2013, 14, I don't know. I, I'd have to look, but it's... Uh, 
it, it when I first got that thing, I couldn't believe it. It I was looking at the leaves on the thing, it looked like it was like came out of the Jurassic period or something, yeah. you know, dinosaurs walking around. So I mean super weird. Uh super dark, Afghani, like super unique leaf shape. And um so I've you know veg it up and I flowered it out and it's definitely I could tell immediately it was definitely related to Bubba, but it's yeah. not like anything that I've seen crossed with Bubba before. I don't, they say the lineage is it's basically Bubba Kush crossed with Hawaiian Indica. And mm-hmm. there was some, there was some work done, um, in that line. They, they had bred that line together, uh, a second time, the F twos or the BX twos or whatever they did. Uh, they had a plant called the nuke that went around mm-hmm. for a while and it was decent. Um, but eventually that kind of got thrown to the side once they used the nuke to make the next generation The you know, the Q36 came from ultimately yeah. and that thing just blew everything out of the water. So that nuke, everybody kind of like threw that to the wayside and just focused on the Q36. So it's like a Bubba, like a Bubba Kush, but it's like cream, like super creamy Bubba. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't have like typical Bubba leaves. It's got these short little, like, like, uh, almost like, uh, like clover or I, I don't know how to describe it. They're, they're very, they're just very unique. I have pictures mm-hmm. on my Instagram page. If you want to look, um, the, the resin, it put, it just pumps out resin. It's, it, it, I mean, it almost looks like a, like a, like one of these hype strains that you see now. It's just so caked up in resin. Yeah. Um, the smaller plants don't tend to yield too well, but when I put them in like three year gallons or five gallons and got them nice and vegged up, they do pretty good yielding. It smells like creamy bubba and anise, like that. Uh, again, like a black licorice type, like thing in there as well. Yeah. And it's uh, it's a low it's a low tester. It tests at like fifteen percent. I think my buddies, some people have had it tested a little bit higher, but generally test below twenty percent. But it is very just like bubba, very medical, very yeah. good good effect. It's definitely smokes like it's over twenty percent. Oh, yeah. uh, the, the flavor's phenomenal. Like I said, creamy Bubba. Um, like if you're a Bubba lover, like this one is the this is the ultimate. It's like Primo Bubba. Yeah. Oh, dude, it I is. Mean, it is. Pip has shared it in our little tight circle of friends, and I would say almost universally, um, everyone regards it almost as an improved Bubba. Yeah. You know, like better, maybe even maybe even better than Bubba would be a, a way to describe it. Like, you know, like everything they like about Bubba and more. Right. That's, ex- yeah. yeah, that's how I would Pretty say much. it. And, yeah. and more, and um, more. everything Bub- you like about Bubba, Bubba and more. Bubba kind of, if you don't hit it right, it doesn't really turn out well. doesn't yield well. It's a little bit leafy and it can come out a little bit like soapy sometimes I feel like. Yep. So, uh, this plant, there's none of that. You don't, I mean, even if you run it bad, it's not coming out soapy. It's not coming out crappy like it's still gonna do good so it's definitely like an improvement i mean i wouldn't call it above like above a cut right but it's uh it's definitely like a newer age version of like bubba kush that's the fire yeah uh, improved improved version of, of the bubba so the only reason why i say that is because most people that really love to grow bubba for their head end up growing q36 for their head and being totally happy with yep. that plant and not having to grow Bubba for their head because they get everything they like about Bubba right? and and a little bit more from it. So and that's just, pretty high praise, really. And just to clarify, a lot of people get confused. The uh, the Illudium is the Q36. It's the, it's yeah. the Q3, Illudium Q36 space modulator. It's the Mar- the gun that Marvin, <laughs> the Marvin the Martian used to use on the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the full name is, you know, Illudium Q36 space modulator. There you go. There you go. Um, and what was it? Um, there was a weird breeding trait that I had where uh, something about seed making, how it makes seeds. Yeah, it doesn't make seeds. I've tried to seed the thing numerous times, and the same thing happens. I get, you know, 20, maybe if I'm lucky, 30, 40 seeds out of each pound. Uh, 30% of them are premature, fully like big seeds, but just white and hollow. Jeez. And um, and then the other ones, some are mutated, and then you sprout what you have left from that. You know, whatever ten or twelve seeds you get out of that, fifteen maybe, and mm-hmm. uh, you sprout them, and then some are 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 uh, like mutant, like super mutant. There's like maybe twenty five, thirty percent of them, from what I've seen, yeah, have, have been like mutant or runty or slow, you know. And then uh, a small percentage of them, though, are are really nice. 
I bet. I bet. So it's it's been it's it's a lot. It, it, it it's a tough pill to swallow when you try to pollinate a plant and you got to yes. rip apart a pound of weed to get you know ten or fifteen seeds that you can grow, and then only a quarter of those are going to be something decent, and only a percentage of those are going to be something amazing. Yeah. yeah. By the time you were done slicing and dicing, h- how much came out? I was thinking to myself. So he gets five seeds he likes. I did cross it to the silver pearl. And I grew those seeds and I did find an awesome selection, a really, really awesome selection. And it kind of made it worth it for me. I've posted it on my Instagram page. It's Does uh, it make seeds? Extremely resinous. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. So um, it's extremely resinous, uh, maybe even more so than the Q36. It's just absolutely caked on there. I'll get that picture over to you as well, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I made two selections. They're both very nice. One is just super unique. It kind of has the um, – I like that, that like black licorice, like, oh, like yeah. anise or I don't know how you pronounce it. But I like that in stuff. And I like it in the Q36. And the the – so one of the selections I made has it's kind of like a lot of that and less of like the other aspects. Yeah. It's kind of like focused in onto it. And it's not like the most ideal plant. It's not a huge yielder. It's kind of wiry, but it's got good flower and it's got that flavor and that smell and that taste that I like. So I keep it around. I don't think a lot of people understand that too, when it comes to reversals um, is that uh because there's other things you've done too, like with your East coast sour diesel cut, reversing it where like it works, but it doesn't really give you enough seed that you can like even share it with friends. It's almost like you, it, it gives you 15 or 30 or 40 seeds or something. So you can't even make, yeah, you can't make packs of it. It's like even difficult to share with homies because you get so few and it took so much effort to do, Um, so there's just certain varieties out there that for whatever reason, don't, don't reverse well, or don't take seed, don't take pollination well. Um, and it makes it really hard to make hybrids with them. Mm -hmm. You know, now speaking of hybrid making, let's get into where you're at now, where, where you're at currently as of the time this podcast is going to air. Where I'm at in my seed making? Yeah. Uh, well, I am at a, uh, the point where I have already made the rubber city, and I did uh, a rigorous selection process trying to narrow down what I feel like were the best plants out of that run. Yeah. And um, and I've grown them and cropped them and, and just done everything I could to really like make sure they're what I want and what I want to use. And uh, and then I have uh, – I, 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 the one is the 10 – the uh, rubber city number 10 and the other one is the rubber city number four. So maybe before you go any further, just talk for a second about what made the rubber city. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. And we'll go forward Uh, from there. Yeah. The, the uh, rubber city was the uh, sour diesel reversed onto the um, sensi star at the time, but the four way. Yeah. Now. And that's what, uh, what I created the original rubber city with. So, that's, so then you hunted that a bunch. So I, I grew out probably mm, right around 50 seeds. I can't remember the exact number. I grew out about 50 seeds of it. And these are all females and that you're growing. All, fem- all females, yeah. yeah, all females. So big selection. And they are, they, it was just absolutely beautiful. Okay. I couldn't have, I couldn't have asked for better results. Um, I ended up cloning about half the run uh, for backups just because everything was looking so good uh, yeah. halfway through. I usually take my clones off the flowering plants, you know, a small branch or something like that, yeah. just so that they aren't constantly growing. They're just revegging in a stasis mode for a while until everything's finished. Yeah. Um, when you keep a lot of moms, you kind of have to. Right. Like you have to figure out these little tactics to oh, yeah. not have things outgrow each other and keep things in a stasis <laughs> while being healthy at the same time. Yeah. Right. So I, um, so I, I definitely selected about half of them and then I did another run immediately after the seed run was done just to double check because, uh, some people may not notice this, but, uh, seed plants, seed plants versus clone plants of the same exact copy of the genetic is, can drastically differ, oh, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe not drastically, but they can differ, yeah, they can a, differ a good a amount, lot. you know, yeah. like 
uh, uh, seed plants usually tend to be more vigorous and yield more. And, you know, do you guys agree with that? Oh, yeah. And Hermes, too. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. They got, the, yeah. Uh, so I grew out a bunch of those. I made selections of half of them. And then I did about uh, probably four, maybe five rounds over the course of like a year and a half of narrowing it down. I would just grow, you know each grow i would narrow it down from like you know half of them to yeah. 20 to 15 to 10 and like once i got to like i remember getting to like eight of them that i had to choose between it was just like i they were all so good that they all would have been good you know i had yeah. to like nitpick like this yeah. one this one structure is a little bit floppier than this one but they're all st still fire you know yeah S super good so i just kind of splitting hairs there you go yeah. Yeah, I was splitting hairs. So, uh, but eventually, I had um, I had narrowed it down after several different runs to uh, the Rubber City number ten and the Rubber City number four. Go figure. I would find two of my best selections in the first ten seeds, huh? Yeah, right, right. Out of, out of the first, I popped fifteen, and the number twenty was banging. Um, <laughs> Just so everybody knows, he resisted the urge to name it Rubber City one hundred and eighty nine. He didn't yeah. have yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> his, his effort to make it seem like that, you know, so uh, props right. on that one. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, I'm not concerned with the, the numbers. You know, I, I post pictures. People know what I do. People know yeah. what I run. Like, And we um, actually, I remember when you were doing those selections and like the first round, you're like, oh, my God, guys, I don't even know how I'm going to cut through these, let alone pick one or two oh my you know gosh. yeah i remember all was, that. i mean the other part of it that was funny too was he would pip would call me and be like so i smoked two or three examples and i'm now ruined and i don't think yeah. i can judge anymore for a while because i'm already so baked i kind of have to chill out before i can try anymore mm -hmm. yeah you know because that's what happens too. like testing a large number of things sometimes it's like you can only test two or three a day you know because you wake up and you try a few and then all of a sudden your day's changed. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to keep a fresh palate and a, and a fresh head, you know, it's a yeah, slow it process is. to do it the right way. You got to do it over the course of, of days, weeks, you know, months, if you got enough stuff, I guess. Right. So I'll say one thing and then I'll shut up and let <laughs> Pip talk. But one of the things I think that's cool that not very many people out here in breeding do anymore um but we have some friends that do is that they make a hybrid like rubber city and then they hunt the hybrid and then they select uh favorites from that and then they do further work yeah. right a lot of breeding today is sort of one step one off one and done you make it you release it it's there till it's gone um and you know uh what we're about to talk about right now is pip you know, he made his some of his favorite selections and then he he, you know, he used those to make more things. So let's start off with um, rubber band. Uh, rubber band. Yeah. OK. Rubber band is the rubber city number 10. So all this stuff on the on the rubber city drop is my rubber city 10 selection uh, that I reversed. Uh, so okay. that would be the rubber city 10 cross to uh, triangle Kush. Okay. So I did that. Uh, I named it rubber band as it's supposed to be said all as one word, kind of like headband, rubber band, yeah. headband. That's kind of my take on it. You know, um, sour diesel, OG Kush, the rubber city 10 is a, is definitely more of a sour diesel leaning looking type of plant. Um, even though I consider it multiple times better than sour diesel, I'll smoke it over sour diesel yeah. any day of the week. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's what the that's what the rubber band is. Um, I did a uh, I did a couple other ones. Um, I did the the threw the chem D in there. Everybody loves the chem D, and it's already got those those funky, dirty like you know, yeah, really really gassy and skunky type of like smells to it. So I figured that would be a good one to throw against it and and just produce some nice yielders. And that's called uh, dirty rubber. Or, and that's going to be your, that's going to be the dirty rubber. Yep. <laughs> I like that name. Great name. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, we have the, the star dog. You use the Corey yeah. Haim cut for burning I did. rubber. I did. Yep. Um, like I said in the description, it, the, I've always liked the uh, star dog, that star dog cut. It's a high yielder. Uh, I pulled off some nice runs with it before it makes big flowers. Uh, super gassy. Um, uh, 
you know, JJ did some good work with really good work with that line. I enjoy that plant. It's a great cropper and it's still got gas and, uh, and it shares a lot of similar traits with my rubber city tennis. You know, they're not the same plant by any means, uh, but they both are very vigorous growing big. They're that commercial style growth yeah. structure and stretch and bud that you want, you know, like the colas. And, uh, so I just, I figured, you know, it'd be fun to, to cross them together and, uh, and, and see what kind of craziness comes out of those things, you know? Yeah. And I see you have um, some Rubber City Back Cross 1 and Rubber City Back Cross yep. 2. Let's talk about those. Yep. Yeah, two different versions of the Back Crosses. I uh, I crossed the uh, Sour Back t- or the uh, Rubber City 10 to the uh, Sour, and I also crossed it to the 4-Way. Okay. So you kind of have a choice. You can kind of pick something that you're going to want to look, want to see a little bit more 4-Way, or you're going to see want something that you're going to see a little bit more um uh sour you know yeah the gold coast hash plant all right gold coast hash plant let's go yeah so the gold coast hash plant uh is my uh, rubber city 10 selection cross to death coast sister so some of you people are familiar with my death coast it makes a lot of really good extracts uh especially solventless it's popular loudest popular <laughs> it's really it's it's really it's the impressive. loudest you should have ever had <laughs> and there's it, it produces bunches of it so i run it over my t-shirt screens and save jars of it and send it to friends for a while factor yeah it and is. Uh, so that their wives can scream at them and why yep. the house house smells like a skunk yep yep <laughs> it's for real that shit's for real uh so uh yeah but anyway the uh the death coast was um out of the um the, the BC1 generation I did, I crossed um, uh, Sour Diesel and Death Star mm-hmm. and made a selection. And uh, that was the popular one at the time. But a lot of people don't know that I made a secondary selection as well, uh, yeah. which was definitely a more sour type of uh, looking plant. Um, and, uh, you know, I enjoy it. It was a little bit different than Death Coast, and I've been smoking it for a long time. And uh, eventually I started, um, I was making Death Coast hash, and I said, oh, I'll make hash with uh, the Death Coast sister too this time and see how it does. Because every time I break it up, you know something's hashy when you break it up for a joint. And you see, you can just see it all fall onto the table. You move, oh, the, yeah. you move the pile of weed a little bit, and there's there's a line of hash left, you know, yeah, after you break dumps. it up. Yeah, yeah it just dumps. So... Uh, and I've always liked the plant. So anyway, it just, you know, I broke that thing up and it was, it was dumping big time, big, big yeah. time. And I was just, I just, the, the smoke was phenomenal. I was like, I got to do something with this thing. This is, this is too good. So, uh, I crossed it to my rubber city 10 and, uh, when it was seeded up, um, breaking it up when it was even cause seed, seeded plants are, you know, notoriously thought to not produce as much resin. Right. Um, you there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Seeded plants are, are thought to not really produce as much resin, right? Well, this thing dumped just as good, if not better, <laughs> seeded yeah. as it does yeah. unseeded. And it just, I, I've got the pictures on my IG. You can see the gloves. It's just after every couple ounces, two, three ounces, breaking it up with your hands, the gloves are just so caked that they're falling apart and ripping. Like you have to switch your gloves and. It's um, pretty wild. It's pretty wild stuff. To, to and see. is that what is the Death Coast sister? Is that what we would call like internally the SD uh, BX seven? Yes, yes, that's what. Yeah, in our group, that was that's like what, the first, the first yeah. name on the label. The Sour Diesel BX number seven plant. Yeah, yeah, not not BX seven, but yeah. BX number seven. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yep. Uh, so I've had that one for a while. It's, you know, pride and one of my pride and joys. Um, I only, I, I, the flower is nice. A lot of people request the flower. I personally prefer to smoke the hash over the flower. Same with the death coast. Um, there, like the it's just, it, it just, the flower is good, but I love, I love my hash. And when I got a plant that, that dumps like this, you know, that's what I'm, yeah. that's what I'm using it for. And that's kind of what I created it for is for, uh, to, to be like a hash plant, you know, I'm, I'm shocked at this. I, I don't know why. I mean, because you were you're this is one of the cuts you were real open with about sharing. Yeah. I don't know why that this didn't hit the like boom past the hype market and just shoot to the top because of how <laughs> much it dumps like uh for resin production, extracts, right. how loud it is. Like some people will smell this as as straight up skunk, I think. Some right. people like I, I smell more burnt rubber with that back end, mm-hmm. but to a lot of people, this is gonna be one of the skunkiest things they've ever smelled. Strangely. It's- 
I think the skunk comes out stronger in the hash. Definitely. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. You know, and I, I mean, think that happens with a number it's just of amplified. Strings. Yeah. Uh, the skunkiness is amplified in hashish. Yeah. It, it really, it really is. It's, uh, I love my hash, man. <laughs> yeah. Make good hash too. Uh, what else we got? Let's see. Uh, talk about the, um, premium rubber. Yes. Premium rubber is one of my pride and joy creations. Uh, that is both of my rubber city selections crossed together. Um, you still there? Yeah. yeah. And okay. So, so that's four, where... so the four and the 10. Yeah. Yeah, the four and the ten uh, crossed together, and those are t- my two favorite plants. That's all I smoke, really. Uh, I, I, you know, I smoke silver pearl. I smoke. I throw I mix other stuff in, but my daily smoke for the past four years has been pretty much the Rubber City Ten or the Rubber City Four. The Rubber City Number Ten is more of a high yield, like higher yielder than the four. Like as far as like bigger buds, I shouldn't say. I mean, it's slightly higher, higher yielder, but it's bigger buds. It's more along the sour side of the spectrum, but it's still yeah. got all the gas and skunk and onion and rubber. It's got all that stuff in it, but um, and it's like the high yielder. So it's kind of like the all star. So I look at that as like the, my commercial, the commercial all star, and then I have the number four, which is like my head stash all star. Even though yeah. I smoke them both the same, but the the head stash one is a little bit less sour diesel, more like. Uh, uh, it's got the sour diesel. It's got all the, the gassiness, all the skunkiness, all the everything, but it's got a lot of uh, aromas and potency from um, the four-way cut. So yeah. it, it's got, it's very, very hashy. Like it burns. Um, it, it When you take a hit off a bowl and you set the bowl down, that bowl just keeps burning a little trail of smoke off of it. Like when you're smoking hash out of a bowl, right? Yeah. Uh, but it, with just the weed. It like that's you know, and it tastes like hash, and it is just one of the most potent plants. I put it right there next to the Death Star. You know, it's yeah. it's it's just uh, you know, it might surpass it. I, I I really, it's so, I don't know, man. It's my favorite plant that that I've ever made and I've ever selected, and I'll probably have it with me till I go to my grave. Yeah, yeah. I'm, if I can I'm control still, it, I'm um, still partial to the pearl, but this stuff for people looking for like those volatile sulfur compounds, right? This is such a special plant, such right. a special plant. But don't forget so, about his pearl s ones that he's got because those are pretty, <laughs> pretty phenomenal too. So I have no doubt uh, people are going to find some extremely nice plants in uh, all, not all of this, of course, but especially the premium rubber uh, with that four being crossed in there. Um, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean there could be some, some serious unicorns pulled out of that thing, Yeah, I think. Uh, and, um, so that's kind of one that I, that I really, I really take a lot of pride in. I like that one. And then I have the, the last one would be the Goodyear, which is the rubber city number 10 S ones as well. Uh, cross yeah. to it, cross to itself. And, um, and those will be, those will be extremely high yielding. They will be more along the lines of sour, but a lot of them are more, uh, the rubber city 10 is more, it's more dense than a sour, but it's not like dense, like indica dense. It's just yeah. not as loose as like sour is. And, um, and it's easier to grow. Sour is a finicky plant. Uh, yeah, definitely. It, to, I mean, you can grow it and get it to come out. Okay. But to get it to come out 110%, like you really got to, you know, you got to, it's really easy. It. It's really easy to uh, make boofy sour. Too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Big I've time. seen a lot of bad sour that, that was actually sour, but just bad. It's easy I'm, to screw it up. I'm guilty. Yeah. I've done it yeah, before, you know, definitely have myself. Um, but it's just sour is just such a tough plant. And that's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this, uh, is just because it's, it, these plants are, I feel like better than sour mm-hmm. and, and they are easier to grow than sour. They're not as finicky and sensitive and all that kinds of stuff. And yeah. I feel like, you know, people say clones lose vigor over the years and stuff like that. I didn't have sour diesel in the nineties, so I don't know what it was like back then, but, uh, today it's still a nice plant and vigorous and it makes a good yield, but it's got nothing on the, on the rubber city 10, like, it's just this, the rubber, like we were talking about how alludium is like the new Bubba, like the, the rubber city number 10 is basically like how I look at it. It's the new upgraded version of sour diesel. Like, I know the guys in our group are running it like that too. Oh like yeah. They're dude. using it and, and working it into lines as their new sour of bitter and crybaby and those guys. Yeah. One thing maybe that I thought we sh- we could mention real quick uh, before we run out of time here is that 
the when Pip was just talking about uh, you know some of these hybrids, he actually did something that I think is really cool and it's kind of it's actually super rare, which is most times when people make feminized hybrids, they're either outcrossing it to a totally different line or they are s wanting it. And one of the rarest things is to uh, make feminized seed from two different examples from the same line. Yeah. Right? right. So making something like the RC10 by the RC4 is actually something that's super rare. It's actually a feminized rubber city line. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's for it's further work. And it's one of the rarest things that you'll see on the market because almost all feminized reversals, like I said, are either S1s or outcrosses to something different. It not line work. There's very little feminized line work in a way. So I don't know exactly know what you'd call RC10 by RC4, like how you'd exactly F1R. Like, you know, yeah, that's F1 what we call F it. What? F1R, F1 reversal, just F2. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it can't it's the second it, generation I, of rubber city. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a reversal. It's in the same line, so it's it's in crossing it in a sense too. It's just it's a pure rubber I guess city it line. F one. It's not. That's, it's F two. It's not an F one. Yeah. He's right. It would be an F two. Yeah. F two yeah. R. Because it is a totally, totally different clone. Yeah. F two R. Yeah, you're right. But I just wanted to point out that in 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 feminized <laughs> seed, it's that that line is one of the rarest things, which it's line work but made feminized style. It's not an outcross, and it's not uh, an S one. It's not inbred. It's you know. It's uh, two full sisters crossed to each other, which doesn't happen that often. Yeah, I've seen it happen quite a bit lately. I think people are finally starting to catch on to stuff like that. Um, and if if my theory is correct about uh, the super skunk trait, the Afghan T trait being a a a what is it double recessive, then every time you cross two of the Afghan T types together, you're reinforcing that trait and you're getting those volatiles sulfur compounds like just stack it and stack it. that's what i think is going right. on and like this is that ultimate example of that i mean know? if you want some of its parents or some of its some of its rarer stuff that could be in the line to pop up that would probably be the line to look through yeah oh yeah then I mean, like i said man there is going to be i mean i haven't done a ton of that line yet i've just done small populations but the uh you know eventually i would like to throw down a couple hundred seeds of, of of premium rubber and the good year and uh even some of the 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 uh, bc work you know yeah um and just really go through them like the right way unfortunately like i in my position you know, up until this point, I've only been able to test like 50 plants, around 50 plants of each line that I make. Yeah. And, you know, that's done me pretty good. That's given me some really nice selections. Um, oh, yeah. Surprisingly, uh, you know, I really didn't think it was at first when I first started all this, I didn't think it was going to be that easy. I figured I'd have to look through a thousand seeds to to find that one, you know, and sometimes yeah. you do. I yeah. feel like, you know, you, you probably do. But, if you're uh, popping haze, maybe. Right. <laughs> So I had to troll sometimes, Tom. I mean, sometimes you get lucky <laughs> and you find it in five. Sometimes you right. find it in 50. Sometimes it takes multiple rounds because right. you didn't find exactly what you were hunting for. So it just is, you know, it's it's a law of, it's a roll of the dice and a law of averages. Yeah. 50, 50 has been good for me. Like I said, I have found some amazing seeds and uh, or amazing plants and, and 50 seed populations. Um, you know, uh, you know, you do 50 seeds of premium rubber or the good year or something like that. And I mean, we're talking you're going to be seeing everything those lines have to offer that's i mean you're going to find you're going to find some really 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 nice stuff you don't need to pop 100 seeds you don't even really need to pop 50 you know like you just you know get a few packs and then that's another thing i'd suggest if anybody's interested in like figure out what line you want and um and buy multiple packs oh. yeah am that i here a mis that's a yeah. mistake i made okay. early on in my in breeding is uh, I would go to Amsterdam and I would buy like 20 different things instead of buying a bunch of packs of a few different things yeah. and having more to look through because I got excited. Um, so sometimes having more seeds of one line is better than having, you know, one pack of eight different things. Also, from a breeder's perspective, when I get orders in, and since I'm the one filling orders and I think, you know, Pip's going to be too, when we see someone old order multiple packs of one line, 
like 99% of the time, I'm going to hook them up with like multiple packs of other lines too, because I know they're doing serious stuff. I know they're being serious about what right. they're doing. So I'm more likely to do stuff like that. Give them and, free stuff. and, you know, surprisingly, it's, it's, it's kind of rare. Not very many people do that. Would you it agree? It is that rare. Yeah. No, it's, it is that it's, rare. It's, huh? Yeah, it's definitely that rare. And that's oh, okay. why when I see it, I'm like, yeah. yes, I'm going to hook this dude up. They're serious. Yeah, people yeah. know what they're doing. People that are on a mission, they know the strain they want. They know they want to find the one. So they drop the money on it. They make the investment. And, you know, yeah. it doesn't matter what it costs as long as you get the plant. That plant, you can make the sky's the limit, whatever, however much money you want, because uh, you have that plant for the rest of your life. You know, it doesn't matter if that seed costs $20 or $30 exactly. or $40, whatever, you know. Hell, that, thing, that plant will pay itself back when you grow it from seed. Yeah. Um, and then you have it forever. So it's always nice to find that special one. So anyway, if you, if, if you're gonna, if you're looking at the menu, you know, just, uh, just pick a line or two or whatever that you're interested in and, uh, and, and get a few packs of it, you know, two packs, yeah. I mean, you're going to, you're going to be happy with all the plants obviously, but it, it's a lottery. It's a numbers game when you grow seeds as everybody knows. Um, like I said, I got lucky with my number 10 and number four, they were in the first 10 seeds of, uh, of a larger progeny, you know? Yeah. It's just the roll of the dice sometimes. Uh, but, um, but you're going to be happy. I mean, you're going to be happy with anything you get that's crossed to the River City 10. They're all going to be really nice plants. Of course, there's always some better than others. Um, but like I said, it's just a numbers game. Grab, you know, two, three packs. Uh, that should that should be enough for most people. If you're like extremely serious, you know, um, and you really just want to guarantee you're going to find like just, you know, one, two or three or more awesome, like, insane blow your mind stuff then uh you know make the investment and get you get you at least like yeah 30 seeds 40 something like that if you can afford it but it's not for everybody um what now that's, that's my advice if, if they want to get any of these how do they get a hold of you um they i will be uh doing the release this tuesday at uh what time did i say it was let me check my notes here real quick uh yeah tuesday january 31st 6 p.m pacific and 9 p.m eastern time all right tuesday january 31st yep okay i put the wrong date on the back bumper but thankfully we're covering it up so you can't see it <laughs> i was like okay yep good job stoner <laughs> and they will be able to get those um you can go to the link in my bio on on either on my souvenir seed co page or my pips weed page and there's a link there to take you to a url where you can view the menu and everything and read all the instructions and then uh, once you made your uh your choice then you'll just email um i believe it was i just Su made the email souvenir Robert, seed co no actually not oh. Su souvenir oh. seed co if you have any questions for me but the people running the the sale and everything is not me gotcha. so that, oh, that's only order related questions on there and that email or uh yeah that that email will be the uh, rubber city drop at protonmail.com so rubber city drop at protonmail.com once you're uh once you've looked at the menu and you have your order ready then uh, all the instructions are out that url and you can get a hold of us and uh and we'll get you set up nice and good all right that's awesome so yeah you also have your Instagram, your Instagram page where you can yep. find all these pictures of all these amazing plants. Uh, what's your Instagram? Uh, my Instagram, personal Instagram is uh, pipsweed, all one word. And then my other uh, seed company Instagram is Souvenir Seed Co. Okay. And yeah, um, thanks for coming on and talking about all these old strains and, and what you got going on now. We'll have to have you come back on sometime soon. You know, yeah, I look to forward to it to to talk about some of the shenanigans we've all gotten up to this went so fast so i figured it did it, you know there's so much more we could it talk really about did. i just want to say one more thing um sure. to all my supporters out there and everybody who's supported me through this venture and everything i really do appreciate it uh, i put a lot of care and passion and love into what i do and it brings me a lot of joy to see other people be happy from you know growing my work and uh and and my strains and to hear all the stories and um uh, it just it just brings me a lot of joy. So I love doing what I'm going to do. What I do, uh, I'm going to be taking a break for a while. I don't have any plans in the near future, but I will be back at some point. I promise. And uh, you know, one love to you guys. Thanks for all the support. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on and uh, letting everybody hear from you. It's a it's an honor. Yeah. And Thanks for having know, me on the show, Matt. One yeah. of the things I'll I'll say to that is that in addition to the history part that Matt and I did. 
uh, one of the one of the main reasons why we did this podcast was to give people a chance to listen to how like weed nerds like like to chit chat about various different things. <laughs> and so Pip is a is a very good friend uh, who we've been chatting for a long time uh, in private, years and years uh, chatting about different stuff. And so um, it's it's cool to bring uh, personal friends on who have get a chance to talk about their passion, their work, what they're interested in. Um, and I think that like the way he breeds is pretty neat because he doesn't really do any hype stuff too much. He kind of like, if you listen to this podcast, he kind of like collected strains over the years and he picked favorites and then he decided what happens if I mix these favorites. And that is sort of like the basis for what he's been doing. So it's a very personal approach in my opinion. Um, he bred things he liked, which is something I always tell people to do, pick things you like and try to find things you like, you know, and don't care about what the rest of the world thinks, find things that you think are interesting. And I think that this list, uh, definitely represents that in a big way. And yeah, I think that's and, a big positive. And it doesn't matter if your family gets upset that you hang out at rest stops. And with that, <laughs> this will be at the end of the show. Thanks for like it was like I was connected with everything around me all of a sudden I just started questioning everything I'd ever been told you know by the time by the time I got high that very first time when it started to hit me and I'm like wow I got high Got, 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 dude. Perfect script from up north, dude. Kind of on it.